Hello and welcome to the Chapter 12 Overview of Patterns of Inheritance. Before the 20th century, it was believed that heredity was a blending of traits, and this occurred through blood. That's where the term bloodlines comes from. However, there was a problem with this idea. This view could not explain some of the observations of early biologists studying inheritance. Some offspring would have traits matching the grandparents and not the parents. For example, if a particular plant that had red flowers was mated with a plant uh, of the same species that had white flowers, the next generation plants would have pink flowers. If you then crossed fertilize those pink flowered plants, the next generation of plants would be expected to have all pink flowers if blending inheritance were correct, but what they actually saw was some plants in that third generation would have pink flowers, as expected, some would have red flowers, and some would have white. Many researchers at the time were trying to solve this problem and figure out how blended inheritance could produce this type of result. One of the scientists looking into this problem in the 1860s was named Gregor Mendel. Mendel's approach was unique in that he was the first to apply math to the problem. And he worked with pea plants and concluded that the plants transmit distinct factors to the offspring so it would not be in blood. Pea plants were a good organism to study because other research had produced pea hybrids which were needed to do genetic studies of this type. There were many pea varieties that were available. They were small and easy to grow and peas can be self-fertilized or cross-fertilized which again makes them ideal for this type of study. Mendel studied true breeding pea strains for seven different traits. Each trait had two alternative forms or variations. For example, in this first one, one form was purple flower and the other pure breeding strain was for white flowers. So in this example, he cross fertilized a male white flower plant to a female purple flowered plant. And he also did the reciprocal cross, which is the opposite, male purple flower to white female flower. All of the F1 plants, F1 means first filial generation, so from that initial cross, all of those F1 plants produce the dominant variation, which would be purple flowers. So we call that the dominant trait because it's able to hide the other trait, which we refer to as the recessive trait. So purple flowers are dominant, white flowers would be recessive and not expressed. Because Mendel was working with pea plants, that F1 generation, those plants with purple flowers, were self-fertilized. And the F2 generation, which is illustrated up here in the chart, produced 705 purple flowered plants and 224 white flowered plants. He calculated the proportion of purple flowered plants to white and it turned out to be 3.15 to 1 or approximately three quarters of the plants were purple and one quarter were white. As you can see in the chart, experiments with the other six traits had the same results, an approximate three to one ratio between the dominant trait and the recessive trait. Further studies revealed that one quarter of the purple flowers were pure breeding for purple that would represent it in this these individuals here so they would be uh, self-fertilized and produce only purple flowers one quarter 
were pure breeding for the recessive trait of white flowers, and then half, these individuals here in the middle, produced both purple and white progeny, and so the actual ratio is not 3 to 1, but 1 to 2 to 1 meaning one quarter of the F2 generation were pure breeding for purple. Half were, pure, were hybrids and one quarter were pure breeding for white flowers. The modern terminology that we use today stems still from those early experiments of Mendel that hereditary trait passed down from one generation to the other we now know as genes, which are a sequence of DNA that codes for a trait, for example, this purple flower color. An allele is the form of the gene, so one allele is purple and one allele is for white flowers. A locus is the specific location of a gene on a chromosome. Offspring inherit one allele from each parent, so the term homozygous refers to an individual whose both alleles are alike, as in the case of a pure-breeding purple flower plant. If the two alleles are different, one is purple and one is the recessive white, then the organism is referred to as heterozygous. A genotype is the code for the inherited alleles of an individual, and the phenotype is the physical traits that, that is displayed of that genotype. We can illustrate that somewhat here with these two homologous chromosomes. This gene here that's represented in the box is a gene for a particular trait at a certain locus or location, and there are two alleles. One is a capital G representing the dominant allele and one is a lowercase g representing the recessive allele. So since there is one dominant G or dominant allele and one recessive, this organism is heterozygous for that particular gene. If they were both capital genes, G's, then that organism would be homozygous for that particular trait. And this is the organism's genotype then. It would be written GG. The phenotype would be whatever this G represents as the dominant trait. So if it was for green colored peas, then this organism's genotype would be heterozygous, big G, little g, but the phenotype would be green. Those proportions or ratios that Mendel discovered are called the genotypic ratio and the phenotypic ratio. And we can use those to predict the possible uh, the probability of certain phenotypes or genotypes in the next generation. So here we have a Punnett square. A Punnett square is basically doing math with letters or symbols to, to calculate the phenotypic and genotypic ratio of the next generation. So let's go through this. In a Punnett square, symbols are used to represent the genotype. A capital letter is used for the dominant phenotype and a lowercase for the recessive phenotype. So in this case, purple is our dominant phenotype, so we usually use the first letter in the dom word for the dominant phenotype. So a capital P is for purple, and a lowercase p is for white. So if a pure breeding purple male, that would be two, whoops, sorry about that, that would have two capital P's, so that would be the genotype for the male, were crossed with a female that had white flowers, it would have two lowercase p's. That would be the genotype for the female. Both of them are homozygous. After writing the uh, genotype across the top for the male and the bottom for the female in the boxes, you fill in the letters in the remaining, remaining boxes uh, based on what's above and to the left of it and that predicts for you what the offspring will be. So all of these boxes will end up having one capital P coming from the male and one lowercase p coming from the female. So all of the progeny will be heterozygous and their phenotype will be purple. These organisms are known as hybrids. The phenotypic ratio is the proportion of physical traits that, it's, that is inherited, and it's always written as the dominant to the recessive. So in this case, all four are going to have the dominant phenotype 
and none will show the recessive because they will all be purple, so there will be a 4 to 0 phenotypic ratio. The genotypic ratio is always written as dominant, homozygous dominant, to heterozygous, to homozygous recessive. So there are three numbers. And so in this case, there are no homozygous dominant individuals. There are four heterozygous individuals and no homozygous recessive individuals. So the genotypic ratio is 0 to 4 to 0. So Mendel did this type of cross with all of those traits, crossing the pure breeding strains of dominant phenotypes to recessive to get hybrid individuals. And that's illustrated here in this top picture, again, still using the uh, purple flowers. So he crossed a purple flowered male with a purple flower, uh, white flowered female and did the reciprocal cross. And in both cases, all of the progeny were hybrids that were purple. He then self-crossed those hybrids. So you have heterozygous individuals, big P, little p, being crossed with each other. And when you do that Punnett square, the result looks a little different. This is known as a monohybrid cross. When you cross two uh, organisms that are hybrids for one particular trait. Now, in this case, what he got was three quarters of the progeny had purple flowers, so that's the dominant trait, and one quarter or one uh, fourth had white flowers, the recessive trait. So the phenotypic ratio he, he got was, again, that three to one ratio that we saw earlier. The genotypic ratio, how many of them were homozygous dominant? You can see there's one that has two capital P's. There are two that are heterozygous and one that is recessive. So he got a one to two to one ratio. And it turns out that every time you do this, you cross, do a monohybrid cross for a trait that has only two alleles and you have a clear dominance recessive situation, the phenotypic ratio will always be three to one and the genotypic ratio will always be one to two to one. So from Mendel's research, we have developed Mendel's principle of segregation. Two alleles for a gene segregate during formation and are rejoined at random from one from each parent during fertilization. Let's break this down. Two alleles for a gene segregate. That means they separate during formation. That means formation of the gametes. So this is talking about meiosis and the two alleles separating. This is meiosis 1 when the homologs separate from each other and go into different gametes. This is the reduction division when the diploid cell is reduced to a haploid gamete. The alleles for that gene are rejoined at random during fertilization, one from each parent. So that's when the gametes fuse back together. Many things have come out of Mendel's research. For example, Mendel's five element model. And this is stated in your book. The first element is parents transmit discrete factors. We now know them as genes. The second is that each individual receives one copy of each gene from each parent. So you receive one homolog from one parent, one homolog from the other parent. Each gene has different forms called alleles. We saw examples of this, purple flower versus yellow flower. And alleles separate randomly into gametes. This is known as the principle of, separ uh, sorry, principle of segregation that we just mentioned. And then the fifth point is some alleles will be expressed. Those will be the dominant alleles. And some will be unexpressed. Those will be the recessive alleles. Okay, so let's relate this to humans. Humans are not the ideal specimen to study genetics. We have a long life cycle. We don't reproduce quickly. We can't self-fertilize and so forth. However, we still can look at human genetics using a couple of different methods. One is pedigree analysis. Pedigree analysis is studying genetics in humans using family histories or pedigrees. 
A pedigree is a chart of a family's history with regard to a particular genetic trait. It's often used to determine inheritance of genetic diseases. In a pedigree chart, boxes represent males, circles represent females. If they show the uh, trait that's being followed, then the shape will be filled in. So in this example, we're following a dominant uh, trait, and the first generation, the male is expressing that trait, and the female is not. They have three children. Two of them express the trait, while one does not. Of those two that express it, uh, they, they have children that also express the tra trait. So you see the trait expressed in every generation. This, this is typical of a pedigree that has a dominantly uh, inherited trait or allele. By contrast, a recessive, I'm sorry, a recessive pedigree looks a little different. In this case, the trait may seem to skip a generation. For example, in generation one, you do not see the trait being expressed, nor is it expressed in the second generation, in uh, generation two. These half-shaded shapes refer to carriers, people who are in the heterozygous condition, so they have the recessive allele, but because it's being masked, they're not showing the trait or expressing the trait. In order to express a recessive trait, you would have to be a homozygous recessive individual. And that is what you see in the third generation. This individual here, number one, and number three, are expressing the trait, even though their parents and grandparents did not. This is an indication that this is a recessive trait and that those two individuals are homozygous recessive. And also, uh, siblings, a sibling from the, this family marries someone else who then has a child that expresses the trait. So that's again further confirmation that this is a recessive allele hidden uh, and not expressed until you end up with an individual who is homozygous recessive. So, so far we've covered sections 12.1 and 12.2. We're going to continue our discussion in a second video. Thanks for watching.